The biggest reason why Wi-Fi tends to not be stable in homes is because you have all of these devices competing for real estate, so to speak, in the air and trying to get all the bandwidth that they need in order to be able to communicate and talk back to your network and to the internet. And if you think about it, it's not just your home and all the devices in it, it's also your neighbor's houses that surround your home because the signals don't just stop at their walls, they actually leak out of the walls and go into other units. If you've ever tried to add a device to your network, you know what I'm talking about. What happens is you have to pick your network from a list of other networks that are available and those other networks that are available are the ones that surround your house. So there's a lot of bleed over and there's a lot of competition in the Wi-Fi space. So it's no wonder you can have internet connections that aren't stable when you have high demand and a lot of devices trying to talk all at the same time. The way you can fix that is to make sure your devices have a hardwired connection back to your router in your home so that way it can talk to the internet whenever it needs to and not have to compete with other devices that are in your Wi-Fi space. Now you might be thinking, well, I don't wanna really wire everything in my house. And the truth is you don't have to. You can just hardwire the things that are the most important and the things that you want to be extremely reliable and have reliable internet connections. So for example, if you have a home office, you'd most likely want to wire your computer or your laptop, make sure it has a stable internet connection for those important Zoom or those important conference calls that you have to connect to. Another device you'd probably wanna wire is your television. So if you have a smart TV, most likely that TV has an ethernet port on the back so it can not only connect to your network over Wi-Fi, but you can hardwire it as well. That will make sure that whenever you sit down to watch that movie or your favorite show, that you don't have any issues whatsoever with a lot of people trying to compete for the same Wi-Fi space. Same thing goes for gaming consoles. If you have an Xbox or a PlayStation, you'll wanna make sure to hardwire those as well to give you the most reliable connection back to the internet. Now the hardest part to this whole thing is running the network cable from the location wherever you want to hardwire your device all the way back to your router. Now fortunately, uh, it, depending on how old your home is, if it's been built within the last 10 to 20 years, you probably already have network cabling within your walls. If you don't have a network port that you can plug into directly, you probably have a phone jack and that phone jack wiring a lot of times is what's called CAT5 cabling. So if you have CAT5 cabling in your wall, that's going to be the minimum specification that you would need in order to turn that phone jack into an ethernet port where you can plug in your computer. The only thing you have to do in those cases is change out the port that's on the wall from a telephone port to an ethernet jack in order to get the right connection. And if your house is wired with CAT5, you probably have everything going to a distribution center in your house. So a distribution center can either be a metal or a plastic casing. Usually it's either in the center of your home or it's in a common location like the basement, possibly underneath the stairs. And that's where all the connections come into in your house, either uh, your telephone connection or your cable connection. So like for your cable TV, for example, all those things should go into your distribution center. So if you have those two things in place, if you have Cat5 wiring or higher, so you could have Cat5, uh, Cat6, and you have a distribution center in your house, it is a home run. You can easily convert the jacks that are on your wall, uh, like I said, to a network jack, and then also install what's called a switch or a router in the box that's uh, your distribution center for your house. Now, if you don't have the right cabling in place or if you don't have a distribution center, you're gonna have a little bit more work to do. You're just gonna have to be prepared to fish uh, wires through your wall in order to get them from the location in your home where you want the internet connection all the way back to wherever your central distribution point is, wherever you want your internet connection to be basically in your house. Now this is typically going to be wherever your internet access is now because that's where you want those connections to end up. So if you have a Wi-Fi router in the middle of your house or if you have um, something in your basement, wherever your Wi-Fi router is, or your cable modem, uh, wherever that internet connection comes back into your house, that's really that point that you probably want to make your central location to have the wires in your home routed back to. So as long as you have access to a crawl space or if you have access to a basement, like an unfinished basement, to where you can send cables up a wall and then route those over to a central location wherever your internet connection comes into your house, then you should be good. Just know that you'll have a little bit more work having to get those cables into the wall and having to cut out holes in the wall in order to put your network jacks in place. Depending on the number of devices you wanna hardwire, there may be enough ports on your router already to plug in the number of cables that you need to make all the connections. If not, the easiest thing to do is to buy something called a switch. A switch is basically just a box that has a lot of ports in it to where you can plug in additional devices. So basically what you would do is you would plug all of your devices into the switch and then you would run one cable from your switch into your Wi-Fi router 
and then that would be all the connection steps that you would need to make in order to get everything connected to the internet. Now, of course, there are a lot of different options depending on the layout of your house, how many devices you wanna to connect to, um, if you have multiple floors in your home, all these things definitely play a factor, but this at its core is the basics of what you need in order to get everything set up from a hardwired connection standpoint in your house. In addition to hardwiring your devices, you may want to add additional what's called access points to your Wi-Fi network as well if you have a Wi-Fi network that just tends to not reach every place in your house. If that's the case, the process is the same. The only thing that you would do differently is on the other end, instead of having a computer plugged into it or a TV, you would have an access point or an AP plugged into that. It's basically just another router or amplifier, if you will, that will extend the signal of your Wi-Fi network to another section of your home. So if you have a really big home, say it's a ranch style home that's pretty spread out and you have your internet connection on one side of your house and you always tend to have connection issues on the other side of your house, then the thing that might fix all of your problems for you is to simply just run a wire from the one side of your house to the other side so that way you can install another wireless access point or a wireless router that can act as a wireless access point in order to extend that signal. Now they do make alternative devices to this. You don't necessarily have to hardwire your house in order to extend your Wi-Fi network. They have these things called mesh routers and mesh networks that you can set up. But the problem I found with those is they tend to not be as reliable as a traditional Wi-Fi network. So I tend to shy away from them. So as I touched on earlier, there are different categories and types of ethernet cables. So I wanna cover that briefly here. So if you're looking at adding additional cabling into your house, you wanna make sure to pick cabling that is rated for your specific needs. So for example, if you want to add wiring, I would go with a rating of at least a Cat5e cabling because Cat5e has a higher speed rating than just standard Cat5. Also, Cat6 is probably the thing that you might want to choose over Cat5e. It's rated a little bit higher, uh, but it can be a little bit harder to work with too. There's also Cat7 cabling that is rated for even faster speeds, but typically in a home or even a small office, Cat7 isn't necessarily needed, and it is a little bit harder to work with as well than Cat5e or Cat6, so I typically don't recommend Cat7 cabling. Some other things you should be aware of when selecting cabling, there's solid copper wire uh, for ethernet cabling, and there's also stranded wire. The solid wire is going to give you a more reliable and a solid, no pun intended, uh, connection uh, than the stranded wire will, but the solid wire is going to be a little bit more expensive than the stranded wire. For me personally, my preference is to always go with solid wire. Um, it is going to be a little bit more expensive, but in my opinion, if you're gonna go through the work of installing cabling in your house or even just a single room, uh, then I would want to install the best cabling that I can. Another rating you need to know about is this thing called a plenum grade rated cable. So if you're gonna run any cabling through air handling space, like if you are going to run it through any kind of HVAC ducts or anything like that, you wanna make sure you get plenum grade cable because the plenum grade cable is not going to emit toxic fumes in case of a fire. Um, non plenum grade cable is pretty standard and it's safe for walls and typical installations. But if you are going to install cabling that goes into any kind of an air handling space, you wanna make sure you get plenum grade rated wire. Another rating to be aware of is this rating called riser grade. And this is similar to a plenum grade rating. This is gonna be more applicable to commercial installations though than standard home installations. Another thing you'll see when it comes to ethernet cabling is this rating that's either STP or UTP, and that stands for Shielded Twisted Pair Cabling or Unshielded Twisted Pair Cabling. Shielded Twisted Pair, or STP, is going to be the best bet for any kind of an environment that tends to be a little bit noisy, so you have fluorescent lighting, things like that. Unshielded Twisted Pair is generally fine. It's also gonna be a little bit less expensive and a little bit easier to work with as well. So if you don't have a noisy environment and you're not really concerned about a lot of interference from electrical wires and things like that, then you don't have to buy shielded twisted pair or STP wire. You can go with unshielded twisted pair cabling. However, shielded twisted pair cabling is the best option. So if that's what you're going for, by all means, knock yourself out. Last thing on cabling specifically is if you're going to run any cabling outside, uh, make sure you get cable that it's rated for outdoor use rather than indoor use. Pretty much most of the cabling is rated for indoor use only. So if you are looking at adding uh, wiring to some location like a shed, for example, make sure you get cabling that's rated for that specific purpose. So now that you know how you're laying out the cable in your house and you know what kind of cabling to get, 
The next biggest thing you need to know is how to make the connections look right in the wall and be able to accept a patch cord. So this is a patch cable. This is one that's unmade and you can either use patch cords, uh, patch cables that have been pre-made or you can make them yourself. Now, the nice thing about these are if you create them on your own, um, you have some more flexibility in making sure that the patch cables are the exact length that you would need to go between your device and the wall. So you don't have a lot of extra cabling just kind of laying around. But at the same time, you don't have to go through uh, to this extent. You can certainly just buy one of these off the shelf and then you'll be fine. The bigger challenge is installing these jacks in the wall, which are called keystones. And these keystones are what accepts the wiring that's run in your wall in order to make a jack so that way you can plug in a patch cable and connect your device. Now these can be a little bit difficult to wire, but the easiest way I've found to wire these is to go with a specific type from a company called Legrand. Now Legrand has been around for a long time. They make different things when it comes to uh, electrical components. They also make things from an AV or audio visual standpoint and they make these really nifty connectors uh, in the system that they have called OnQ. So this OnQ system, basically what happens is all you have to do is lay the cables in the back of the keystone and you just have to follow co color coordination that's laid out on the keystone itself. Uh, once you have the cables in the keystone, then all you would do is put this keystone, slide it into place into this crimp tool and then crimp it down. And it will make all of your connections all at the same time with one simple squeeze. So this is a really great solution to be able to do wired networking connections in your house, especially if you're not used to doing them all the time. Now, as a contrast, to show you the difference between a standard telephone jack uh, and an ethernet jack, this is the size difference. You can see these come in different colors as well. So if you have uh, almond colored face plates in your home or white colored face plates in your home, uh, then you can get jacks to match. And they even make these in blue if you wanna go with something a little bit different. Now to make the connections inside of your distribution center, it's gonna be a little bit different because it's not the exact same configuration, the exact same process as a keystone. So you're gonna need a different tool and this is called a punch down tool. And basically all this is, is just a, a device that has a blade at the end here that allows you to be able to set the cord and the cable. It just has this little tool at the end here that's sharp that will allow you to push the cable in place and seat the connection. And this will make a noise when you push this down to help you know you've applied enough force. There's a lot more things I could talk about and cover in a video but I wanted to keep this as simple and short as possible and make sure you have an understanding of the entire process. So if you'd like me to go into more depth and more detail on anything that I've talked about, or even maybe something I haven't covered or talked about in this video, be sure to leave me a comment below. I'd love to make a follow-up video to this or maybe even turn this into an entire series. So be sure to leave me a comment below. Otherwise, be sure to hit the like button if you've liked this video, if you found it helpful, and also check out this other video next. I'm sure you'll like it too. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.